And now I'm actually now my new venture. Uh, we're about to have a huge product launch. It's called Blabber, which is a uh, world's first referral uh, marketing uh, software for companies that have sales teams. It's patent pending. It doesn't exist today. So I'm pretty excited about it. Mm. It is very exciting. We were talking yeah. uh, quite a bit about it before the show. I had to pull Shasta off of the conversation so we could get started and actually record. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was some good stuff, guys. Um, We're back. We are back with another episode of Chicks in Charge Automotive Edition. I am Jess. I'm Shasta. And our guest today is one of a kind. We have the CEO of 321 Ignition and founder of Blabber, Lyman Savvy, with us today. Well, Hello. Lyman. How are you doing? Good. How are you guys doing? So <laughs> good. Doing great, especially after that quick chat with you right before the show. We're super excited that you're here. Thank you. So am I. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to sit and chat with us. Of course. Let's get this party going. Yeah. yeah. So so for those that are listening right now, but might not know who you are, tell us how you got your start in automotive and what solutions you are bringing to the table. So um, I got my start in automotive actually when I first um I met one of my old friends. Uh, she, her brother has a car dealership, an independent car dealership in Washington State. I live in Bellevue, Washington. Um, Bellevue is Seattle, if some people mm-hmm. know what Bellevue is. Anyways, and so she kept asking me for marketing advice. I've been doing marketing for over 22 years. Um, my specialty is lead generation, customer acquisition. I've worked at a, a lot of startup companies that either got acquired or became publicly traded in NASDAQ. And then I also worked at Fortune 100 companies uh, like Microsoft and Capital One. And so um, and every company I've ever worked for, it's to generate leads. You know, how do you generate leads, acquire customers, and especially not just, um, you know, uh, there's two types of businesses, you know, how do you generate lead for a company that has a hundred percent self-serve model mm-hmm. versus how do you generate leads for a company that has a sales team? And so that's my specialty is to actually both is basically how do you acquire customers at the lowest cost per acquisition at the highest lifetime value? Uh, and so when she would always come to me for marketing advice and then I, you know, got more and more interested and sucked into somehow into mm-hmm. auto. And the next thing I know, I started uh, first, um, automotive mobile first website platform called 320 Ignition, later was acquired. And now I'm actually now my new venture. Uh, we're about to have a huge product launch. It's called Blabber, which is a uh, world's first referral uh, marketing uh, software for companies that have sales teams. It's patent pending. It doesn't exist today. So I'm pretty excited about it. Mm. It is very exciting. We were talking yeah. uh, quite a bit about it before the show. I had to pull Shasta off of the conversation so we could get started and actually record. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was some good stuff, guys. Um, so this is, like you said, uh, first of its kind referral marketing tool. Who is this good for? So it's good for any company that has sales teams. So, for example, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but Tesla actually has one of the most famous referral programs. Tesla has never done any kind of marketing. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, the way they actually generate business is purely through their community of drivers. So when somebody buys a car, my fiance actually has a Tesla car. That's how I know about it. So when you buy a Tesla car, you download their app. And in that app, it actually says, sync your phone contact list, refer a friend. So you sync your phone contact list. And then when you click on your friend's name, it opens up your native text messaging app. And it um, pre-populates a link um, for somebody to click on and go buy Tesla. Well, of course, that's great for Tesla because you could actually buy a Tesla 100% online. But in automotive, even though we have digital retail tools and everything, but really, we, you know, a salesperson is still engaged. And so for dealerships, um, there isn't uh, any kind of solution. The only solutions right now dealerships have are actually two things. One, what I've noticed, which I think is a customer torture, I can't believe dealerships are doing this, but it's basically imagine somebody just bought a car. And a dealership would ask them, hey, can you introduce us to some of your friends? And they'll give them a piece of paper and ask them to write down their friend's contact information. Mm-hmm. That to me is insane. I actually saw a video on Facebook where one of the trainers was doing that. And the guy bought a car from this girl, Teresa, and he had amazing service. He was excited to introduce it to his friends. But because Blabber didn't exist to be able to do the warm business introductions, he was actually sitting there and on a piece of paper writing down 40 of his friend's names. Oh, no. And I'm like, 
if somebody would have given me a piece of paper and said, write down 40 of your friends' names, I'd be like, are you insane? Uh, I type 60 words a minute. If somebody just tells me to even sign a receipt, it looks like, a, you know, doctor's signature, like my hands <laughs> are shaking. So can you imagine somebody telling me to, here's a piece of paper, write out your friend's contact information. Mm -hmm. And the worst part is, you know, when I ask uh, dealerships, I'm like, so what do you guys do with those pieces of paper? Who puts it in the CRM? And they're like, nobody, because salespeople hate entering data in the CRM. Nobody likes entering data in the CRM. I'm like, okay, so that means you really don't know what's the status. You know, how do you follow up? How do you nurture mm -hmm. them? Like, you know, what you normally do with every lead. And then uh, most important, I'm like, so when Teresa calls the friend, does a friend expect the call? Does she know that her buddy just came from? It's like, no, she doesn't. So I'm like, well, then that's not a really a referral. You just have a bunch of people's phone numbers, which mm -hmm. you can get from anywhere. Uh, so that's, you know, what's happening right now today, either that or dealerships will, put, will create like a basic form that says, you know, um, tell us your friends who might be in the market to buy a car, we'll contact them. And so when I ask dealerships, I'm like, how many lead, how many referrals do you generate per month from this lead form? They're like, maybe one or two per year. I'm like, okay, so that's not very scalable either. So then what happens, like one of the dealerships uh, told me it's a really huge auto group. I think they have like 26 stores. Uh, their salespeople, of course, they want to generate say, uh, referrals, but because, you know, paper doesn't work and lead forms doesn't work. And the worst part also with, you know, right now with the system says payments, <laughs> you know, salespeople are actually getting frustrated because when somebody buys a car from them and they're excited, they build this trust with them. And then they say, hey, tell, you know, refer your friends when they buy a car, we'll, you know, give you, I don't know, $250, whatever the reward is. But then the, the friend refers um, their or the customer refers a friend. The friend buys a car, and the the referral never got paid. And then they, of course, they get upset, and of course, now they hurt the relationship with the salesperson. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's because the billing teams and the dealerships are so busy, you know, processing, you know, other things that they need to take care of, you know, parts and labors and payroll and things like that. They don't have time to processing commissions for referrals. And so what's happening now is that salespeople are starting to do their own referral programs. And so like the big auto group I'm mentioning, it, it got so bad where um, even though they have 26 stores, each salesperson's running their own referral campaigns that's not actually aligned or approved by right. the dealerships. And then they're doing some fuzzy math, uh, you know, in the back end when they're, you know, closing the loans and things like that. So it's like, there's no compliance, there's no auditing, there's no transparency, there's no scalability, there's no nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, basically the current solutions don't work. And so I'm pretty excited to launch Blabber and replace all of that, all of that chaos. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting. And um, I mean, I was thinking about it for us even, you know, we're uh, probably self-sustaining sales wise. I mean, um, Jess is our, our one man sales team other than, you know, the promotional marketing we do on social media and stuff like that. But having something trackable like that, where, you know, when somebody does an intro for us or, um, you know, connects us with somebody, having that connection and being able to track them and make sure they get paid, that they get paid on time. Um, I mean, that's, that's so that valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing is also gamification. There's a, have you guys heard of a um, app called the uh, Duolingo that teaches you how to learn? Yes. Language? I'm on, <laughs> I'm on a uh, 600 and something day street currently. Yep. So yes. <laughs> Congratulations. So if you actually listen to the founder of Duolingo, he's some scientist and psychologist, whatever. And I actually listened to his TED talk. And he talks about how do you get somebody to learn a new language? How do you have those, what is it, 600 something they uh, straight? Mm -hmm. And they say, have you, um, well, what's their slogan? It's like, have you, um, have you practiced today yet or something like that? Yeah, something like that. And so he says, the way you do it is gamification, is you make it fun. Like, and so mm -hmm. the TED talk is actually called, how do you make learning a new language as addicting as social media? We're all addicted to social media. How much time do we spend on social media? And he talks about gamification. So as you know, like when you open up your Duolingo app, it has a bunch of like little games and confettis and a bunch of other stuff. It, it keeps you going, right? Mm -hmm. um, same thing, actually, like if you look at the um, uh, Robinhood trading app, mm -hmm. you know, Robinhood was on a mission to uh, make investing fun for average consumers, you know, people who are not day traders. How do they do it? Gamification, you know, like when you place your trade, there's a confetti is kind of happening mm -hmm. and there's you know, a bunch of games. And so that's actually what we did with Blabber too. So when you're making uh, referrals, there's a couple of things, actually. One, of course, there's the regular offers, like, you know, uh, make an introduction and you earn blah, you know, when somebody buys a customer. And you could actually customize 
uh, one, do you want to do a one-time reward? Do you want to do a recurring? So like if you're a SaaS vendor, you could have a recurring commission. Uh, you could do percentage of a sale, percentage of a gross profit, or you could do a fixed amount. Uh, you could also actually, which has never been done before, I've never seen this before, is where you could actually reward somebody just for introduction and then a bigger reward when introduction becomes a sale. Um, oh. Which usually, you know, referral marketing is always when you get a sale, but this is like, well, no, if I like, for example, if I'm a SaaS vendor and I'm so confident in my product, but I just need to get in front of, you know, the business decision maker, just make an introduction. I rather pay you per lead versus paying Zuckerberg $5 cost per click or, you know, Google $5 cost per click. And so, but then the gamification part is it also has a bunch of things like bonuses, for example. Uh, if you hit a certain milestone, you get a bonus. So for example, if you make your first introduction, you make a X dollar bonus. You make your fifth introduction, you make X dollar bonus. So that's a gamification where it's like, what level are you on? Mm -hmm. uh, or you could also create multi-levels and say, you refer your first five customers who become, uh, or five friends who become a customer, you earn, let's say, $200 you know, reward. Mm -hmm. The next five, you're going to make 250. The next five, you're going to make, you know, 300. So you could do different tiers and levels. Uh, or you could also do um, uh, one of my favorite things is royalties. So the key to getting the most amount of people referring, it's all about how many people actually join your referral program. Well, if somebody is your huge brand ambassador and referring people and earning commission, they can actually recruit other people to start referring to you. And by them recruiting other people, you could actually also make, uh, let's say, um, tell others to join a referral program and earn 10% of their earnings for X period of time. And so wow. now you have all these other people who are advocates and who know how to, you know, refer people to convert. They're teaching other people how to do it. And they're also mm -hmm. the making a little bit of side commissions. So it's a win-win for everybody. And the best part, what I love about referral marketing or partner channel marketing is unlike if you're doing Facebook ads, you're paying, let's say $5 cost per click, you know, Zuckerberg doesn't care, you know, if you go out of business tomorrow, there's another brand that's going to pay $5 cost per click. But if you have a lot of referral partners, that means every day there's hundreds of people waking up excited that you're succeeded and, ex and excited to help you keep it mm -hmm. because they're succeeding. So would you rather be paying Zuckerberg and help increase their stock prices? Or would you rather have a bunch of people in your community keep endorsing you and talking about you and encouraging, you know, to do business with you. Right. Wow. So um, basically, Blackberry has a lot of gamifications, bonuses, milestones, tiers, royalties, like you name it. And the other best part, because it's a mobile app, when you've actually paid a commission, then uh, your app uh, does a little sound. Cha -ching! It's like you get excited, mm -hmm. like, oh, my God, I got paid. Versus like, imagine if you have to cut somebody a check and they're getting in the mail, like there's no mm -hmm. excitement either. Right. So, I love that. So the 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 concept is brilliant here. And I have to ask, where were you whenever you first had this idea? Like, what oh, struggle were you yeah, facing? What were you facing in that moment that the light bulb went off and said, I need to do this thing? Uh, it's funny you ask because I actually, um, I was looking for a referral marketing software for myself, how to make it scalable. Because every company I've ever worked for, like, I don't see it very often in automotive for some reason. That's the only industry I've never noticed it. But every other industry, referral partner marketing is a huge thing. Like, enormous mm -hmm. uh, like for example microsoft when i used to work there over 80 percent of their sales comes through partner channel ecosystem uh aws i don't know what percentage but it's a huge percentage uh hopspot salesforce like uh toast the other day i was listening to um toast chief revenue officer he did a saster podcast and he was talking about how 40 percent of their sales comes to partner channel ecosystem and partner channel is could be your customers, it could be your industry um, allies, influencers, trainers, like whoever. And it, but all every single one of them, like when I was doing my research, trying to find a referral platform for myself, all I keep finding is these basic lead forms or affiliate marketing, which is all about trackable link. But there is absolutely nothing there. But the, and basically how I came up with this idea is that it's what I've experienced myself. You know, like when I had my three to one ignition company, we had a lot of par like 40 percent of our sales came from partners, marketing agencies and, you know, all these uh, trainers. And, you know, of course, the benefit for marketing agencies like we were a mobile first website provider. So if they refer clients to us, it's going to make their marketing perform better, because if you don't have a mobile first website, it doesn't matter how great your targeting is, how great your Facebook ads look, people are not going to convert. So they would refer mm -hmm. business to us. And of course, we would also give them, you know, percent of a revenue share. 
But the first question always came up as line, and I don't know what to say because, you know, I'm not a product expert. I don't know the right way to phrase it. Can you send me an email? Because I keep sending people an email and they were forwarded on. And I'm like, why isn't there a system to automate that? Right. (laughs) You know, so basically just through my own pain points, like I just couldn't find anything. And I keep seeing, you know, sync your phone contact list. You know, it's how LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, you know, all these companies. So I'm like, why is anybody putting it all together? Right. Well, and and something that it makes me think about is when you see a lot of your friends posting all over Facebook, you know, looking for recommendations for someone to cut my son's hair or mm-hmm. um, I need um, some lawn care or, or my tree HVAC. just, yeah, my tree just fell down my yard. I had it, we, we like she said, with HVAC. And so you want to pick the people um, who are trusted by the people you trust. Right. And yeah. that's, I think, what is so strong in the power of a referral and why those close at such a higher percentage than a cold lead, because this is already tried and true and you will have a firsthand review with your friend. Yeah. You know, the, the trust part, actually. So Sandy Cerami, um, you guys know Sandy, mm-hmm. right? Of course. Ah. So he actually did a video as I'm building my blabber product. He did a video. He posted it on Facebook. And as soon as I saw him, I'm like, Sandy, I've got to have this video. Mm-hmm. And the video he talks about, he's like... Um, when somebody buys a car from you, they're not buying a car from you because they like you as a person. They like you and sure they'll go to, you know, happy hour with you, you know, hang out with you, but they're buying from you because they trust you. Mm-hmm. What's the number one way to get somebody's trust? It's, you're not going to get a trust. So somebody who's filling out a Facebook lead form to contact you through your Facebook ads, they, there's no trust. Mm-hmm. You're really competing on price and inventory, which is the worst way to actually grow any kind of business. That's not a profitable right. way to grow. But when somebody endorses you, when somebody like with Blabber, imagine they just bought a car and now um, they sync their contact list. They're making business introductions. And the best part, imagine they're doing a video with the salesperson saying, hey, I just bought a car at this uh, dealership. Uh, Mid Jess, she uh, provided an amazing service. It's so hard to find people you could trust these days. If you're in the market, contact Jess first. She'll, you know, help you find whatever you're looking for. You know, just a kind of a short video, two seconds. And just sitting there, you know, waving, hey, guys, you know, let me know if you need a car. Send that kind of introduction message, CCing Jess. Mm-hmm. Now, that's trust. Mm-hmm. And like, and there's nothing like that. Exists. There's no way to do it. I mean, except, of course, manually. But right. And now Blabber's going to do that. It's going to have that introduction video that's going out in that in that intro, right? Yep, automatically. So once you've actually in the app recorded the video, uploaded it, it automatically gets attached to all of your introductions. That's so wow. Cool. There is not a single store out there that does not need this for their team. Right. Yeah. I know. Wow. That's why I'm so excited about it. <laughs> so remind us again, how far out are you from officially launching? About a month? Uh, like less than a month. We're basically in the last stages. We're waiting for PayPal to certify the app. Okay. Uh, so we have a call with engineering, their engineering team on Tuesday. Then they said once uh, after that call, it could take two to three weeks. And so sometimes before end of August, we should be going live. Oh, so this is so exciting. <laughs> Thank you. So I have a question for you, but your uh, answer can't be referral marketing. I need you to think outside of the box. Okay. Um, what is it? Okay. So your core competencies include a wide range of marketing skills. Um, when, which one do you find most critical in today's automotive market? Data. You have to be a data nerd. That's actually one of the things that I um, notice in automotive is that. <laughs> just, it, he's the data nerd. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's so easy for agencies to manipulate the data. And so as a GM, as a dealer owner, you have to understand the data. And so like, for example, um, one, you know, there's so many agencies, like if you tell them, like, hey, I have an additional $5,000 budget, you know, how can you spend it? What can you generate from me? And then they will send you basically a report. One, most agencies report on clicks, which they should not be reporting clicks, they should be reporting on leads and the cost per lead. But most importantly is marginal cost per lead. And most people don't even know what that is. And basically what that means is that let's say you were spending $10,000 per month and you were getting, uh, I can't do math quickly in my head. I'm really good at Excel, but I'm really bad at math in my head. Um, But basically, let's say you were generating 1,000 leads or what would be, if you spend $10,000, you're generating a cost per lead $50. What is the math? Is that 2,000 leads, I think? 200. 200, okay, 200 leads. So now let's say you gave the agency additional $5,000 and they're sending a report and saying, um, we've generated, let's say, um, instead of 2,000, 2,050 leads. And here's your cost per lead. 
Well, they're giving you a blended cost per lead. What you should be doing is for this additional incremental $5,000 you gave them, how many additional leads you got? So you take that cost divided by incremental leads, and that's your true marginal cost per lead. How much more did it cost you to generate those leads? And the reason why that's actually really, really important is because, for example, when I used to work on Microsoft, and of course, Microsoft has insane budgets. So it's not even reality. <laughs> but I used to you know, spend like $36 million on marketing. And, you know, a manager will come to me like SVP and say, hey, I have an additional $1 million to spend. How can we spend it efficiently? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times there's diminishing returns. And so, for example, if I, you know, let's say if I'm spending $10,000, I'm in a small little geo area. And then if I need to spend an additional $5,000, there might not be enough people to spend right. a $5,000. Or maybe the agency didn't spend it efficiently. So you really have to understand did that $5,000 incremental budget actually, was it efficient? And so unless you actually separate it from the total budget and separate the additional incremental leads, you actually don't know, is was that the right uh, of investment? Right. So understanding data, so one being able to track leads, cost per lead, cost per acquisition, ROI, you know, return on ad spend, but then also what's the marginal and not just the blended. That's the really, really important thing. And most importantly, also what I see dealerships do a lot is, They'll take their organic leads combined with their paid media leads, and then they'll see the blended, you know, cost per acquisition. Right. Uh, like for example, one of the dealership was telling me he's generating sales at hundred dollars cost per sale. I'm like, that's not possible. And then later on, I found out that apparently he was taking his organic leads and taking his paid media. And I'm like, but majority of it was organic. So your paid media is actually you're spending like two thousand dollars to buy a customer. Oh my gosh! Wow. Yes. Yeah, so understanding data and how to slice it and how to dice it, it's like. In today's digital world, you cannot be a marketer if you don't understand data. Right. Yeah, that's true. And so, also, like, what the levels to pull and push. It's like, I always say, you know, um, a business is like a, um, a machine. You know, what are the inputs? What are the touch points? And what are the outputs? And so, like, for example, with referral marketing, you know, how do you grow, grow a referral marketing business? Well, one, you actually have to have a system in place. If you're generating referrals by accident, that's mm -hmm. not scalable. But, uh, you know, you have to understand, okay, how many people join your referral program? So like first is recruit. How many did you recruit? Second is activate. Out of those who actually, you know, create an account to join a program, how many of them actually made at least one referral? After that, how many, uh, what's the average number of referrals per referrer? And then after that, what's the average conversion per, per referrer? Uh, and then also what's the um, lead to sale conversion rate and ROI and CPL and CPA and things like that. So like being able to really understand what are the touch points in the funnel and how to measure that. Again, it all comes down to data. If you don't understand data, there's like you can't be in digital marketing. Right. You're just throwing spaghettis against the wall to see what sticks. <laughs> right. And so, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh. Uh, so looking ahead, what trends or tech do you believe will shape the future of automotive? mobile <laughs> that's one thing i keep noticing that people are just constantly forgetting about mobile and like and even when i have my 320 ignition company we were the first mobile first website provider in automotive industry it's just for some reason people keep neglecting mobile and so when i started building you know blabber again it's mobile yeah. and people are like well how did you come up with the mobile i'm like because like we're Everybody attached to mobile phone. like literally it's attached to our hip like you don't walk around with your laptop you walk around with your right smartphone mm -hmm. and these smartphones like a lot of them cost over a thousand dollars it's like a computer it's a cool it's literally the cost of a laptop so like how do you not think about mobile it's like mobile is the most important technology it, everything has to be mobile friendly mobile first mm -hmm. i agree i'm on my phone constantly oh, yeah. uh -huh. that's like if you try to use tiktok on a desktop like it is so not user friendly. And same thing with instagram like those are 100 percent made for mobile and so the fact that we forget that well, the funny thing is actually Instagram was actually 100% mobile up to four years ago, five years ago. They finally got a desktop version. Mm -hmm. But for the longest time, it was all mobile. And yeah. as you guys know, like when you do uh, social media paid uh, mar uh, media um, paid marketing, mm -hmm. when you're setting up your campaigns, it actually says, you know, do you want to target mobile or desktop? If you only do desktop, your audience is like fraction. Because it's all yep. about mobile. Uh, what is it like? Eighty percent of a uh, more than eighty percent of uh, social media is mobile. Mobile yep. uh, daily active users. I'm honestly surprised that number is not higher. Oh, I am too. It probably is actually. My numbers might be a little bit outdated. Like I mean, I, I do all my transactions on there. Me too. I do all mine. On <laughs> I pay all my bills on my phone. Like, yeah. oh, exactly. Here at home. Yeah. 
so yeah, so the key uh, one, you know, it's um, fintech. I'm really big on fintech. I'm really big on automation. So I'm really big on mobile user experience. And I always say, you know, uh, user experience or customer experience is a competitive advantage. And mm-hmm. it's actually the most profitable competitive advantage. You know, like if you're trying to compete on price, well, you're just going to roll your profit margins. If you're trying to compete on, uh, you know, the inventory, well, you know, that's also kind of a losing game because you don't really control the inventory as a dealer. It doesn't matter if you're a franchise dealer. It doesn't matter if you're an independent dealer. You didn't actually manufacture your product. Like Elon Musk, you know, Tesla, he has control of the product and he also sells it. But as a dealer, you don't. Like you're at the mercy of a franchise deciding, should they be releasing EV? What is it going to look like? And, Mm -hmm. you know, what features and what the pricing is. So really your only control is user experience. As long as you make everything frictionless, and I always say friction is the enemy of sales. True. <laughs> so. Yep. That's very, very true. So having been named 40 under 40 and women in retail, what piece of advice would you give someone up and coming in the industry if they were to walk through the doors of a dealership today to start their career in auto? What advice? Oh, boy. Um, I don't know. You know, I'm really big on the learning and sucking in all the knowledge. I'm like a sponge, you know, especially with a lot of uh, younger generations, you know, who are graduating from college and everything. Um, I actually had an incident with this one kid who just recently graduated them. And, you know, he was privileged enough to be able to just go to college and not to um, work, Mm -hmm. which I actually think sometimes working, going to college is actually a huge competitive advantage because you're getting real life experience as you're actually also in college. And so a lot of these, you know, especially young generations are graduating from college and this kid had two degrees and, you know, he's, you know, thinks he, he deserves high paying jobs and, and he's going into marketing. And I'm like, you don't know anything about marketing. Whatever you learned in textbook doesn't matter. And so throughout my career and maybe it was right thing, I don't know if it was wrong thing, but I just, I didn't chase after the money. I was chasing after the knowledge. I was chasing after the experience. Um, every company I work for, and the other thing which some people might not agree. I believe in changing companies every three years yeah, as you're growing your career. Because a lot of times when you stay with the same company for 10, 15 years, you're really not learning anything. Uh, later on, when you're maturing your business in your career, you don't need to. But when you're building your career, unless you're in sales, because in sales, of course, you know it's all about book of business. Right. But if you're in marketing, if you're in product, if you're in engineering, it doesn't matter. Like You have to see how startups work uh early stage versus you know when they're race series a when they're going through m a when they're going ipo when they got acquired you know versus fortune 100 companies so if you've always been always in the same company and worse is also if you've always only been in the same industry then your view is very narrow mm-hmm. uh, and so my advice is always for people especially when they're younger chase after knowledge the money will come and right. By also having such a diverse background, you also build a very powerful network. And like Blabber app actually says, your phone book is your net worth. Yep. It's like once you've had exposure to a lot of people and you've demonstrated your value, your skills, it's like money would just be like floating, flo- flowing in. So that would be my advice. <laughs> I, I like that. the line of, um, we say it all the time, your network is your net worth, yeah. but I like your your phone book. Phone book. I like that. <laughs> it really is. It's actually, you know, my right. sister's in sales. So when I was uh, showing her the app that I was building and it actually says your phone book is your net worth. And she stopped at me. She's like, damn. She's like, I never thought of that. <laughs> and I mean, even though she's in sales and I'm like, yeah, yep. like imagine how many people you know and what you could be doing with that network. And, and most people, they don't, monetize our network and there's nothing wrong with monetizing your network like our you know uh, actually one of my favorite um uh, uh what do you call the speeches that i had when i went to uw university of washington in seattle and um i was taking a um i'm a business major i first majored in web design then i majored in business and uh, one of the class i had to take you know to graduate was leadership and we actually had a professor's father who's a renowned uh, professor at some other university he uh, came in on the last day of our class and he had a conversation with us about what are the five sources of power, which is the most powerful source of power, how to get it and how to keep it. And so he started writing down in the board, you know, the five sources of power. It's what you know, who you know, um, uh, extortion, coercion, 
uh, and something else I forgot. And so then he started asking everybody, you know, raise your hand. Who thinks the most powerful source of power is what you know? And of course, I'm in college and I'm like, yes, it's the most powerful source of power. Next is like, okay, who thinks, you know, it's who you know is the most powerful source of power. And I'm like, no way. I'm like, it doesn't matter who you know, because if you're a dummy, it doesn't matter who you know. Mm-hmm. And I literally debated with him the entire class. It's the last day of, you know, before we're graduating. And I debated with him the entire class. It's all about what you know, because I'm like, then otherwise I'm like, what the hell am I doing in this university if it's not about what you know? Right. And I could tell you till this day, and actually building the blabber, I keep thinking about this professor and this TED talk is because it's all about who you know, yep. because it doesn't matter if I could be the most brilliant, talented person, but if I don't know the right people who could make an introduction for me, it doesn't matter. Right, so right. Your biggest source of power is who you know. And 100%. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. By the way, going back to advice, the other piece of advice I would give to anybody, which I didn't do a good job of because, uh, you know, I'm a refugee. So I came to America. I don't have parents, you know, who are in business world who taught me and you decided to learn everything myself. I eventually started hiring professional career coaches who I paid a shitload of money to. You know, to <laughs> um, but number one, actually, lesson that I learned going back to who, you know, don't you know, when you're at work, don't just sit at your computer. You know, if there's a happy hour, if there's, you know, um, go to lunch with somebody, because even if it's and actually, I'll give you a, a crazy story what happened to me at Microsoft. So when I joined a company, Microsoft, I was really pretty senior in my career and I had a huge responsibility. I was responsible for Office 365 product, which is their cash cow, basically. You know, it's the one of the oldest products. They have the most profitable product. And my job was, uh, how do I acquire customers? And the goal was 320,000 customers my first year at the maximum $60 cost per acquisition. That year, I ended with um, 520,000 customers at $47 cost per acquisition. Wow. And the way I was able to do it is because, one, I was nonstop working and I was testing. I completed over 28 tests that year, which at the size of Microsoft, you know, there's you, you have, uh, I was in 60 countries, you know, so it's not like you're just doing one small campaign for a dealer, like to do 28 campaigns for Microsoft in 60 countries. That's a hu- huge that's test. A big damn deal. So basically, huh? And so that's a big damn deal. Yeah, that's a huge deal. And so even though I doubled their customer acquisition goal, I reduced the cost to acquire customers. And back then our senior vice president of marketing was saying, Direct business is doing great, but the more money we add, we actually become less efficient because, you know, there's only so much you could spend on media. And I was able to not only double the business, but also make it more efficient. It was like nobody thought it was it would be able to happen. And guess what? That year, I actually got, of course, a huge bonus and I won a bunch of awards, but I did not get a promotion. And I was in tears and I called up my career coach who was also um, SVP at Microsoft. So she has a you know successful track record. And and the reason I didn't get a promotion, they actually said to me, you know, at Microsoft, Amazon, they have these days called calibration days where the executives they will get in a room and they talk about, you know, um, what do you know about this person contribution? You know what they have done for you. And so basically people who were in that room, they said she didn't collaborate enough. And Microsoft's all about collaboration and teamwork and things like that. And I'm like, what do you mean I didn't collaborate enough? How the hell do you double the goal at the size of a Microsoft with working in 60 countries unless you're constantly on a conference calls collaborating with people, with engineering, right. with local markets? And what I learned from that experience is that I was collaborating with people who were not going to be on, in the room that day deciding my future. Mm-hmm. So they looked at the, you know, performance and they're great, but they'd be like, we, well, we don't, we've never communicated with her. We don't know what she's working on, how she did it. And so my coach at that time, she said, Lyman, why did you double the goal? She's like, even if you would have missed the goal by 5%, let's say instead of getting a hundred percent to go, I got 95% to go. But if I would have been smarter and spend more time with people who would have been in the, in the room deciding my faith, you know, going happy hours with them, you know, meetings with them and asking them, how can I help you and assist you? I would have got a huge promotion. Mm-hmm. And so it's not all about the results. It's also as a woman, a lot of times we think it's all about the results. No, it's all about you know, who you know. It's get out there talk to people, make sure they know what you're doing. Don't just, you know, assume they're going to look at your track record and going to acknowledge it. They have no idea how you got there. So you have to actually, you know, network your phone book, your network. It's all about that. Definitely. Yep. 
I think that, I mean, we started off as a company that worked mainly on a referral basis. I mean, up until probably um, this year, we didn't do any type of cold outreach or um, exterior sales or anything like that. And, and we know what the power of referrals do. I mean, we've made it to a 170 seat BDC here. Um, Referral only. Yeah. See, exactly. Like when you have such a powerful network, you never have to advertise like Tesla. They don't advertise. And I would have never thought about that until today. Like, I mean, they don't even have, I think they may have service centers, but they don't have dealerships, like where you can just go and buy a car. Like everything is 100% online. And the way, and the reason why they're so successful is because they're breaking the mold and doing things differently. Well, the funny part is actually, Tesla actually has a pretty horrible customer experience. My fiance actually has a Tesla and I always make fun of him and his Tesla because one, it's, I think way overpriced. Like if you compare it to the Mercedes EQS or whatever, like the what you get for what you spend is, you know, with Mercedes, like, oh my God, that's so unique. It catches your attention. Tesla, it doesn't matter if you spend 40,000, what did I think start? 60,000 to, you know, 150,000. They all look the same. I'm like, mm-hmm. why would you do that? And and their customer service is horrible because you come into the showroom. There's only a couple of cars to look at. You basically, you know, pre-build and you're waiting for over a year to actually get your car. Uh, but my fiance, a couple of times we scheduled it and they don't even send you email to let you know it's been rescheduled. Not until he actually logs into the dashboard, then he sees it's been rescheduled. And then when they, you actually do the car, get, the car gets delivered, they say, OK, your car has been delivered. You have one week to pick it up. And if you don't, we're going to give it to another person. I mean, talk about the worst customer experience. Wow. It's almost like an abuse. But it, but the funny part is like my fiance, he always t- talks about he's like when another Tesla drives by, he's like, hey. You know, it's like, it's our community. And he always says, he's like, you don't understand, but we have a private club there. So they build this community of people who are advocating, even though they're being abused by Tesla, in my opinion, for the customer service. And it's, and it's like the community keeps, you know, advocating, like, my fiance, he's so huge on Tesla. Dare you say anything negative about Tesla? He was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, you know, cool. yep. And he got sucked into it by his friends. It's all about word of mouth. It's all about mm-hmm. referrals. It's if you build a good community, that's where the trust comes in, even if you're messing up as a brand. For sure. Right. <laughs> I love that. Lyman, where can people reach you if they want to connect with you after the show? Um, anybody can find me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, my company, it's called Blabber. Uh, our domain, in, in, domain is www.itsblabber.com. And so people who love to blabber and people who love to, uh, you know, who are big on networking and helping other people. And by the way, that's the other thing with, you know, blabber. Uh, I take a lot of pride being able to help somebody. If I know somebody and you're coming to me t- for advice, like, I don't know who to turn to. I don't know where to find a great BDC team. I don't know where to find uh, a marketing agency I can trust or which dealership I should buy a car. Like, Especially during COVID, I had so many people reaching out to me saying, Lemon, I know you're an automotive. Which dealership do you trust? Like, I love being able to help people connect people. And at the same time, you know, if you're getting referral bonuses for doing that because you're helping them as well, like, why not? Right. So, um, yeah. So if anybody wants to blabber, you, you know, find me on the Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Lyman Savvy, or it's blabber.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking the time out of your day to hop on the show with us. We've had a great time chatting with you. Yes, me too. Thank you for having me. You are very welcome. All right, guys. In a world where you can be anything, be kind because you never know what battles others are facing. So while out in the world this week, remember to light it up. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'm Jess. I'm Shasta. And that's Lyman. And we've been the Chicks in Charge. Yay, you've made it this far. And if you want to help the chicks out and add some value, make sure you subscribe right now. Click that little red button down below. Do it. Do it now. now.